You're listening to this week's You Ask, We Answer session, a version of OSL's own The Shop podcast, where we discuss life, the faith, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the modern world. It's real talk about real faith in the real God. Welcome back to another session of You Ask, We Answer. Um, we have some questions this morning or this afternoon that I think are very relevant, um, even for, especially for Christians where um, we've been possibly taught these things early on from like a catechism basis, but then over time, um, those certainties and, and focuses on the scriptures can be eroded a little bit, especially if we have an ear to our culture and outside of the, the Lutheran church, um, we can see some doubt leaking in. So before we jump into that, though, as usual, if you have any questions, please send them in. Send them to mark.bray at osomckinney.org, and we will gladly add them to the list and discuss them in the coming weeks. So please do that. Anything you have, um, there is no bad question. We'll, we'll pretty much attempt to tackle pretty much anything you can send us. So please send that in. All right. So our first question is this. Um, and this is a question that I think we could probably answer real simply, but I want to dig a little deeper into it and go a little further into it and talk about the elements of it. So this one says, I'm a baptized child of God. Does that mean I'm saved, assured of eternal life by God? Or is there a way that I can become unsaved? And so right now I think there's a, there's parts of our culture that are kind of split on this, right? There's parts of our Christian culture that believe once I'm baptized, then I'm good. Regardless, and there's others that take a different approach and say, "Well, I see it differently from the scriptures." So, someone kick us off on this. What do, what do we believe as a Lutheran church in this question? Well, I think we we live in an area, culturally speaking, I guess, within the Christian Church of the United States, where maybe there's a teaching that's pretty common for some folks: uh, once saved, always saved. And so I don't know that they would always refer necessarily to baptism, but so there is that theological thinking of, you guys can correct me, is I think there's kind of three approaches really, is once saved, always saved, saved, but can lose it. Well, then we might even have to throw in predestination. I don't know if we want to get into all that. Uh, And then, would that be right? So once saved, always saved, saved, and you can lose it. Or is there a third? Where was the third category? The, the predestination might bring in that you are saved and, um, and God will sustain you to the end. If a person falls away in that tradition, the conclusion is they were never saved. To begin with. Right. Yeah. So I guess those would maybe be the three, once saved, always saved, saved and you can lose it, and then kind of the predestination view of... Whether you are actually predestined for heaven or predestined for hell. Mm-hmm. And I might just back up real quickly here, uh, just shortly, because knowing our international or at least our Beyond Lutheran audience, for some of folks, even the idea of the, the way the question's formed of, am I baptized? Does that mean I'm saved? I know there's many in our area that would object to that, mm-hmm. even the idea that baptism saves. So just quickly, it'd be, I think, helpful to explain a Lutheran view of baptism, that, that we do not view it as something that we do, something that merits us any kind of credit or grace with God, but baptism is the Word of God working through the water to deliver to you the forgiveness of sins, the rescue from death and the devil, and gives eternal life to all who believe. You once were lost, now you're found. And the Spirit enables you to grasp God's gifts by faith. And so we very much view baptism as a work of God and a gift of grace to us. Yeah, and I would echo that with the, the catechism uh, speaks to uh, what benefits does baptism mm-hmm. give. It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death on the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. Right, so it quotes, which are these words and promises of God? Mark 16, 16, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So so, so does that, whoever believes and is baptized mm-hmm. will be saved. So let's take 
whoever, like, you have to have belief for baptism. I'm asking as a question. You have to have faith for baptism to be valid, yes or no? Because whoever believes, so what if it was like, well, once you don't believe, then why are you even bothering with baptism? Yeah, we, we probably answer this a little bit differently, whether baptizing an infant or an adult. And so <clears throat> my understanding of, of baptism, like, say, for the infant is in the gift of baptism, the Holy Spirit, one of the things the Holy Spirit works is faith in the one receiving mm-hmm. baptism. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted to line it up in timing-wise, then, you know, I guess the, the Spirit creates faith and that faith receives the benefits that God delivers in God's work of baptism. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And that also is an understanding of faith that I think is very mm-hmm. biblical, that is not merely an intellectual understanding mm-hmm. or grasping, mm-hmm. but, but is a trust or a confidence in the promise that's given. Right. Yeah, because the adult is, you know, publicly professing that, yes, I believe in and desire baptism, and Christ has commanded me to be baptized, and so they're coming to baptism with what Dave is talking about is, you know, some intellectual assent, faith is still by the Holy Spirit working through the gospel, has awakened faith in that person, and now they're the ones receiving the benefits of baptism in their baptism. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I was drawing that from, I was reading through the Book of Concord, and yeah, I have a, I have a book crush on the Book of Concord. I love the mm. Book of Concord, and if you're so if you're, you're not <laughs> if you're not familiar with the Book of Concord, it's basically the Book of Concord um, that is an explanation of the Lutheran Confessions, um, and I'm just doing a commercial of it because I love it um, because it, it it gives a lot of stuff to think through and a lot of um, background to why we believe certain things. So if you're not familiar with the Book of Concord, holler at me and I'll hook you up and, and connect you with that. Um, we can talk about it. But it said here, it said, without faith, it profits nothing, even though baptism is in itself a divine, overwhelming treasure. And so what I, the reason I kind of, this was a quote from, I guess, large catechism, so Luther. Um, so the reason I gravitated to that, because it seemed to touch on the question where it was like, is there a way I can become unsaved? And so it's talking about without faith. So if I walk away from the faith, truly, completely, then is my baptism still saving me? I think that's where the, the heart of this question leads. Yeah, and I would, what I'm hearing behind this question a little bit too is whether a Lutheran sometimes talk about baptism in such a way that would lead you to conclude once saved, always saved. You know, that, well, I'm baptized, so all is well. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't have anything to worry about, which is not a proper representation of what Lutherans teach. But sometimes the way Lutherans talk, that's the conclusion you'd maybe come to is that we think it's one and done. You're baptized. So everything's good. And and I think, like David said, is, you know, faith is always present and faith is that thing. And in that Mark 16, 16 reading, the, the only thing that condemns is unbelief. Mm-hmm. So for a Lutheran understanding of Scripture and the way the economy of God's grace works, we would look at, you know, I've been baptized, I have the gift of faith and salvation in Christ, and through a sinful life and failure to repent, I might walk farther and farther away to the point at which I no longer have faith, and in the end, I've rejected the salvation that Christ gave me on complete deposit, and so I forfeited it through unbelief. And so that's why a Lutheran would not say once saved, always saved. We would say, yes, saved completely in baptism, but through sin and the hardening of your heart and walking away from the gifts that God has given to remain in Him, the vine, you could drift to the point of unbelief. And so that's why we take sin seriously in terms of repentance, church discipline, excommunication, so that someone might see the seriousness of going down a path of sin, knowing it's sin, and not having any repentance of it is because it's a real threat to to the faith that you've been given. Right. And you could end up on the wrong side of the judgment if that's not corrected. Right. You know, when we started, you kind of laid out um, kind of three different responses to this. What's interesting is in, in all three of those camps, 
we all agree on Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace we have been saved through faith. But, but I would echo what you just said. Faith is necessary. And um, another verse that came to mind, and, and this verse was problematic uh, to me when I was in that camp of believing once saved, always saved. But this is from Colossians 1, 21 through 23. It says, You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled you. So past tense, it's completed, it's done. Mm -hmm. You are saved in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed this is the problem for once saved, always saved. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. So there's Mm. this call for an ongoing faith. Now, we have to be careful here. Because people hear this and they think, oh, so there's something I have to do to make sure I stay right, saved. Right. Well, the reality is God's done it all for you. Christ has died for you. Uh, your sins are forgiven. He's given you the Holy Spirit, and he's placed you in the church. And in the church, you hear the Word of God, which strengthens your faith. You receive the Lord's Supper, which strengthens your faith. You fellowship with God's people. Um, you've used the illustration before, um, Tim, in terms of the log in the fire. Mm, when you mm-hmm. remove the log, there is a chance, separated from the fire of those things that nourish the heat and the fire and the flame, it will eventually die out. Not because you've finally committed that one sin one too many times, mm-hmm. but because you have turned away from the gracious gifts that the Lord is constantly offering to us. That's a perfect explanation. Whoever asked this, listen to what Pastor Thompson just said. <laughs> and, and, and you really have the fullness of the answer there. You know, you really do is Christ doesn't remove the gospel from you or the gifts. You remove yourself from those gifts that sustain and, perse- and, and make faith persevere throughout this world, throughout this life. You know, so, yeah, if you want to separate yourself from the vine, that's on you, but we can even go to Romans 8 a little bit, is, you know, nothing's going to separate us from God's love. So the fire or whatever example we're using is always present, always burning, always ready to strengthen and increase faith and to preserve us in the faith. But you can't be away from the fire, you know, away from the word, away from the sacrament, away from, the, away from Christ and his gifts, you know, so... And that's so assuring to know, what if I do find that I am one who has kind of fallen away and I've kind of quit believing, what do I do now? Repent. Mm, Turn right. around. Yeah, right. You know, Pastor Bray, you, were, you started, I forgot how you phrased it, but you, you were kind of rephrasing the question of, you know, what if I, do, I quit believing? Is my baptism no longer valid? Mm-hmm. I don't remember how you said that. But some people have asked, like, well, do I need to be rebaptized now? Right. And it's like, no, God never withdrew. God doesn't look at you and see you struggling and go, huh, I'm pulling back from this guy. No, your baptism is still valid. The forgiveness of sins has always been yours. So repent. Confess yeah. your sins, receive God's forgiveness, and believe again in faith to grasp his promises as true for you. And I think that's similar, like you'll hear in this area, right, is I rededicated my life to right. Christ. I'm I understand what they're saying, and I'm not even saying they're wrong. I think how we would talk about it is you came to a point of repentance. You know, you drifted, you repented, and you turned, and you came back. You know, I mean, that's, to me, that's really like the rededicated part that David just talked about. That I, I wouldn't even say that they were unsaved. They, through the Spirit, were convicted and came to their senses that they were the log away from the fire, and they want to come back to the fire. You know, and that's the realization that they came to, and the Spirit, like he did at the first time, right, calls and gathers them back into the gospel of Christ and where those gifts are given. And so uh, it's it's good stuff in my mind because I tell the confirmands, this is my favorite session to teach in confirmation. We just had it this last, or no, this month was means of grace. And I just remind them, like when you're that college kid who drifted and you're on the curb under the weight of your sins and the disappointments you've, you think your parents will have in you if they know all that you did, like just know that the image you ought to have in your mind is Jesus is like the father of the prodigal son, eagerly waiting your return and invites you to return. You don't have to clean up your act first. You return to him 
He runs to you and comes to you with his grace and restores you through his his forgiveness, you know. And I just try to beat that into the compromise head as you're always, 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 always welcome back. And the Lord is always excited to see. And there's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, you know. So that's what I try to echo with the compromise is. You know, when you're when you're feeling like you realized all of a sudden the Lord's giving you the sign, it's like I am the cold log. Jesus is saying, "Come back." But on that same illustration, there what was bringing to mind when you were saying there was, um, like when, when I was a kid, we used to we had land, and so we would burn brush. Hmm. Like you didn't put it on your curb because they didn't pick it up in country, you burned it. So you had we'd make these big bonfires and we'd burn it, and then you'd come back like a day or two later, and it would just look like just ash, just death. Like nothing was there. Everything was cold. But then you kind of scratch the surface a little bit and then way down deep, you find this one coal and it's still burning. And so that to me is, is what for me helps illustrate that even though you may think the faith is snuffed out and you're done, God's still keeping that flame there. As long as your heart's beating, God's still pursuing you. Now you can stomp it out if you just fully do it. But it's never a matter of God not wanting you to come back. It, there's always that. And I, and I think about it in my, I, re, I was baptized as an infant, and I kind of went cold in my faith until late in high school, and then it reignited. Um, and so there is that feeling you think, well, now I'm part of the Lutheran church. I want to, do I need to get rebaptized? Because I like the Lutheran church better, and it feels more home. And it feels, so that's a real feeling for people, and it can be a real struggle. It's just redirecting back to, yeah, you may be at a different church now, you may be a different doctrine, but your baptism that was performed 20 years ago is still completely valid, mm-hmm. regardless of what you you struggled with or how cold you got between um, your, your baptism and, and the time where you kind of had this reawakening situation. And such an encouraging word for parents who've chi- whose children, yeah. maybe they raised them in the church, but now they see their children drifting or maybe even having nothing to do with the church. Um, but you keep praying. You keep hoping. Yeah. Baptism is powerful, and God does not let you go. And and I think you, you well said that, Pastor Mark, in terms of um, that, that ember is still there. And so we keep praying, and we keep asking the Lord to intervene and to bring them back. Yeah. All right, any other thoughts on this one? All right, let's look at our second question here. Um, so this this is kind of related. It says, and this one came up during um, a, a Sunday school class, and we kind of milled around on it in a while, and I thought, you know what? Let's circle up on this one because this, this can be a tricky one for people. So it says, will I, will I stand before God's judgment twice? So when I die, will I face judge, God's judgment before entering heaven? Then... When Christ returns for the final judgment in his return to this earth, will I again have to face God's judgment? So there are two situations where I'm going to have to answer for my sins. Thoughts on that? Well, two verses that came to mind from Hebrews 9. And, and y'all, as we kick around these questions, and even as you listen at home, and even as you have your own questions, I mean, the best question, the first question is, well, what does the Bible say? And, and often you can turn and find Scripture. Uh, but Hebrews 9, 27, 28 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now, the Bible says more than this, but at least in these two verses, mm-hmm. it would seem to say there's death, there's judgment, there's the return of Christ, which is not for judgment, but for uh, delivering the, you know, executing the final verdict that's already been delivered to us. Yeah, if there's any judgment, right, it's David Thompson, you died in the faith, come into the room I've prepared for you. I've judged you worthy on account of my work. Yes, and as Pastor Bray said, this is a little tricky um, because the believer gets his end-time judgment now. Mm -hmm. We have the assurance, your sins are forgiven. And so our end-time judgment, as Christ our advocate stands with us, is just that, just what you said. Your sins are forgiven. Enter into the joy of your master. Mm. Yeah. 
And you have this, this sense of, I, I think sometimes we forget that the judgment that leads us to be fearful a little bit is actually the judgment and wrath of God that he poured out on Christ on the cross, right? So, so that is the place where my sin and your sin, our sin, was judged and punished. Once for all. Once and for all, yeah. right? And so that judgment I need not fear anymore because I now, through baptism, have been buried with Christ and raised with Christ. You know, yes, I still live in a sinful flesh, but the Lord still visits me with His grace, and the Spirit still convicts me, and I still repent, and I still turn and receive the the goodness of His grace towards sinners and the forgiveness of sins. And so I don't fear that second coming judgment, you know, of a second death, if you will. Yeah. Because of... I was thinking about this, too, the other day, that I think I've never really... This was probably part of another podcast we had done is, you know, our physical, uh, David was talking about this, I think, of not just simply seeing your physical death as the portal to heaven, I think it was mm-hmm. maybe the last podcast. And that, that was, I really thought about what he had said there, and it meant a lot to me the more I thought about it, because what the cross has removed is that second death, you know, eternal damnation. Yes. Mm-hmm. But this physical death... It is me paying the consequence of my sin. Romans, sure. You what, know, three twenty-three or six twenty-three. The wages of sin is death. Yeah, and so while Christ answered for it, what He answered for is me being spared from that second judgment and yes. second death. The wages of sin is death, but in the resurrection, death is not the final word. Yeah, yeah. So that was helpful to me because I think I. I don't think I'd been seeing that properly until David pointed that out and I thought some more about it and I thought, wow, that's really clarifying, you know, to realize it's that second one that, that should be the most fearful, right? That second death is far more fearful than the physical death, uh, but I still have to have the physical death. But what Christ answered for was sparing me from the judgment of that second death, of eternal right. death. You know? So as, as Christians, we, we can die in the faith here, and not fear, okay, I'm going to be in heaven in this waiting room, and then I got another wrath session coming my way that I hope I get through. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's where, that's where some anxiety can, can surface in that there's still more work to do for me, or there's still more I have to. And so I, I and this may be a stretch, but I looked at like Luke 23 where Jesus is talking to that criminal on the cross, and he says, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And so I think if he's saying I'm going to be in paradise, well, paradise with another judgment in mind coming, that doesn't sound like paradise to me. So, so I read that, and again, it might be a stretch, but I read that as it's pure paradise. There's not more judgment coming my way. There's not more fear or hardship coming my way. All that stuff's in the past, and I'm, in true, I'm truly fully redeemed before God. Now, my body and my spirit haven't reunited yet, but in terms of my standing with the Lord— it's finished. It's done. Right. You're, you're not. You're not waiting in the jail cell, hoping you know for a good outcome for your trial. Right. Because we said earlier, you already know the outcome. I think of John five twenty four, where Jesus says, "I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Mm. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life." So again, same thing, right? There, there is a final judgment. But you already know the verdict. In Christ, the verdict is your sins are forgiven. And if you, on, on that text, it, it, oddly how it doesn't say, if you pray hard enough, if you do enough good deeds, if your family prays enough for you after you've died, like all these things of works, it doesn't say anything about that. It well, says it's belief. Yeah. And it makes me think, too, if something has to be done after death, after physical death, then Christ's sacrifice wasn't all sufficient. Right. Period. You know, it, it got us so far. Right. And now, yeah. Which, is which, which puts a hole in the whole gospel story of the Messiah. So if I'm going to, tr- if I'm going to lessen what Christ did, then, then I'm putting a, I'm, I'm inserting, I don't know, doubt or something, or I'm inserting this insecurity about the gospel instead of having full assurance of it. 
And I, I do wonder if maybe, we don't know, but behind this question, there is a text that is a little bit challenging to me, which is 1 Corinthians 3. Oh, maybe that's the one I'm trying to find. Is that what you're looking for? I don't, maybe. Starting maybe around verse 10, but it just talks about Paul's, well, we won't get into all the details, but basically be careful how you build, because your works will be tested by fire. And if you build with wood, hay, and stubble, they're going to be burned up. But if you build with gold and silver and precious stones, that, that they will survive. But there's still verse 15. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So there's a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. It does seem like there's some kind of sifting of our works, but not in relation to salvation, right? That that's a settled issue. So thoughts on that one? I mean, I think yeah. this has always been kind of a challenging passage of, okay, now how has all this come together? No, that's that's exactly the one I was looking for, and I was looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm like, where is it? I know it's on the front end of Corinthians somewhere, but I'm glad you found it because this is the one passage that leads me to think of some judgment after my death of some sort. And and I like you say, it, it's not a judgment for heaven or hell, but I think it's one of those that, it helps you, you'll see the works of your life and you'll see how much of a blessing those were that were built on, on God's work and, and the foundation of the church or the gospel. And then you'll see those who, if you built on a different type of foundation, you'll see in the end how meaningless those works were as they burn away. Mm -hmm. if, I mean, that's, my, that's kind of how I've interpreted that. But like you said, one of the big things to emphasize is uh, it's not the vertical judgment, right? So if, if anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, but he will be saved. And I think that's where we just maybe get to see some of the works of our lives were more fruitful and beneficial mm -hmm. for the kingdom than others, and those that weren't are burned away. And those that were, there's some sort of reward that we don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, that will be a question Eric Witte submits at some point. Is, <laughs> but I even look I at that other and, and go, okay, there's, there's good of my works here in this life. But if I were to do an inventory and do a scorecard here, my good works are so outweighed by my bad works. And so when I read something like that, I was thinking as you were talking about that, about how if I'm standing before the Lord and he really did an objective view of this, he'd go, yeah, you got no chance. And that, to me, highlights God's incredible grace through Christ because he still says, yeah, you were a top-shelf loser, but I love you and I'm going to keep you with me eternally. Why? Because of what my son did for you, not because of what you did. Well, and I think what a Lutheran really needs to hear in this too, though, is works do matter. Sure. And there are works that God is very pleased with. Mm-hmm. You know, so much to the point of there's a reward in the afterlife as a result of it, right? And, and there's, of course, Lutherans are well aware of the works that we have in our lives that aren't pleasing. But I think we also can't live as if nothing we do can please God because we're sinners. Sure, sure. You know, and I think that's where Lutherans really need kind of a smack in the face a little bit of saying, no, there's great good you can do as God's sinner saint in the world that God will be pleased with. And we'll reward on top of it. We'll reward. But like we said, it's not in or out of heaven. It's, you know, a reward in heaven or lack of a reward in heaven just because you, you went with the wrong foundation. You built it on the wrong foundation. And so I, I look at simple things like there's probably things we might learn like, hey, you preached a text and we're unaware of the fruit that it might have produced, but God might show us, wow, look, you look at all this good that came from proclaiming my word truthfully. Right. Right. That's not really elevating us per se, but but he is saying you did it well. You know, that's good and, and you and it produced fruit and, and there's a reward for that. And I, that's a, such a good word, especially for us Lutherans. And it's true. None of my good works are untainted by sin, and yet God accepts them for the sake of Christ. Mm -hmm. But then I think, okay, but where do my good works come from? They come from God's Holy Spirit mm -hmm. changing my desires. 
they come from God or the Spirit producing His fruit of love and joy and peace. Mm. It's still by grace. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this weird dynamic when we talk about a reward from God. I, I, Paul talks about receiving the crown of righteousness. I love that picture because what do we do with our crowns in Revelation? We cast them at the feet of Jesus. So do, do you see the grace upon grace? It's, yeah. it's God's Spirit in you producing good works that you are rewarded for that now put a few crowns in your hand that you get to lay down mm-hmm. at the feet of the true king. Right. I mean, it's still God doing it all, which I, that helps me be a little more comfortable talking about good works and, and rewards, realizing man, ultimately even all my good works and my rewards are by grace. They're gifts from God. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I like, I think how C.S. Lewis talks about it too is, there, there are moments that we get to be little Jesuses, you know, in, in a sense of where we deliver a piece of the best of who he is to somebody else and they benefit, you know. And so we never confuse ourselves as Jesus, but we get to be little Jesuses as we live the new life, which is his life that he's given to us. And you think about the, the if you think about the moments in your past where, where something really great happened, so many of those have another person attached to them, where it shows God works through people to love people. Mm-hmm. And, and so if we go back to our, our question like the baptism one, can I fall from the faith? If I stop doing good works, I think that contributes, doesn't cause it, but can contribute to me departing the faith. Because if, I mean, if I start abandoning all principles of, of God's word in my actions and in my thoughts, that's just a part. And then eventually I start to move away from it. Um, I always go to the exercise analogy. It's just where my brain goes. And if I stop doing something with enough regularity of not doing it, I'm not going to be able to do it again. And that's just the reality. So I think there's some connection with that in our faith. If I just turn off good works and thinking about like thinking about doing nice things for my wife, then over time I'm going to become callous and indifferent to my wife and the love's going to disappear. So I think our works help us. I, I think works are similar to dashboard warnings on a, mm. in a vehicle, you know, that when, when you see the temperature gauge rising, that's an indicator of something's going wrong foundationally with the engine, right? So if I'm looking at works, to me, it's like if, if I lack them or no desire, then it's not the works that's going to fix it. You know, it's returning to this foundational relationship with Jesus where he works in me and produces good fruit and good works in me. And so if that's not happening... I've got a clog in the line somewhere before the works, if that makes right. sense. Mm-hmm. You know, like I think we always talk about justification as the mother works as the child, like the mother births the child. Mm-hmm. We use that in out, which I really like because the child can never birth the mother. Right. You know? And so I, I look at like it's it's more the mother relationship that's the problem if the works aren't happening. Yeah. Or or I don't care about them or they're not evident. Right. You know. That makes me think of Second Peter 1 where Peter just lists the virtue after virtue and says you should be increasing in these things. So your faith, your knowledge, your self-control, your steadfastness, your godliness, and these should be growing and increasing. But so important to hear his remedy if they're not. Whoever lacks these qualities has become nearsighted and blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Hmm. So when you lack those qualities, the answer isn't to try to muster up more of those qualities. It's to return and remember your justification. Mm. You've been cleansed from your former sins. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. One other thought on your illustration. You know what doesn't help when that check engine light comes on? Is to debate whether we should be paying attention to check engine lights or to talk about is it too bright or too much attention or maybe we should just turn up the radio and focus on singing worship. No, it's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a sign that you need to get under the hood, exactly like you were saying, and, th- and ask, well, what is going on that is producing this warning light? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you, you ignore, ignore it, right? Yeah. They're, they're, 
there will be a time when the light's not going to help you anymore. It's going to blow up. You know? Something yeah, something up. catastrophic will happen if you ignore it long enough. Sure. Call, call out to my sister who um, in high school was driving along, and they said they heard a loud noise. And so her friend said, turn up the radio. <laughs> <laughs> My dad wasn't real pleased to find out they'd driven on a completely flat tire for about five miles. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> they were probably listening to 80s metal anyway, so it probably yeah. sounded the same as grinding metal good only. Good point. Oh, only that's answer. funny. All right. Well, some good discussion on these questions. Hopefully those that submitted it, um, we answered your, your, your inquiry there. If we didn't, if there's more thoughts, if something else sparks in your head from this conversation, get on your computer, email me, mark.bray at oslmckinney.org. And we'll just keep this going. Like I said, this podcast only lives as long as questions keep um, flowing in. So anything you have, send it in. And I know I joked with someone this Sunday that I was going to call them out when they send a question, but I was totally joking. We're not going to list your name. We're not going to say who sent it. We're not even going to allude to uh, who you are. So um, please send those in and we'll continue this dialogue.